Good afternoon. I'm Brent Rusin, Manitoba's Chief Provincial Public Health Officer. Today we're announcing two new cases of COVID-19. Two uh, probable cases have been uh, tested as negative, uh, therefore total number of cases remains at 246. Uh, we are reporting one additional death due to COVID-19. This was a woman in her 60s who lived in uh, the Prairie Mountain Health region. I want to extend my condolences to her family and loved ones. Uh, this brings the total number of COVID-related deaths in Manitoba to five. As of this morning, nine individuals are hospitalized. Of that, four are in intensive care. Uh, 108 individuals are listed as recovered. There are 132 active cases. Uh, yesterday, 305 tests were completed at Cadham Provincial Lab. This brings the total tests completed to 17,902. We caution Manitobans to not interpret these case numbers to mean our uh, uh, risk is reduced at this time. These numbers uh, likely reflect Manitobans' efforts at our strict social distancing strategies, as well as public health efforts at case identification, contact identification, and isolation. This is uh, reaffirming that these measures uh, have uh, been effective, but need to be continued. This is why the public health orders have been extended uh, up until uh, April 28th. This is helping us to flatten our curve, to reduce the impact of this virus, to interrupt the transmission of this virus in our communities. Non-essential personal travel should be canceled or postponed. Those returning to Manitoba uh, from international travel or even from interprovincial travel are required to self-isolate for 14 days. This virus is in every health region and we've seen evidence of community spread. All Manitobans need to take these precautions to stay home for the most part, to practice physical distancing, to only leave for necessary reasons and when you are out to keep that two meter separation between others, to frequently wash your hands. Uh, if you are mildly ill, stay home. Do not attend work or activities uh, if you have uh, symptoms of illness. You know, there's uh, times when people do need to go out and certainly people living with uh, disabilities uh, can certainly be affected by these times. I want to remind Manitobans that there's uh, times when uh, people living with disabilities may need assistance. And so you may see that physical distancing may not always be attainable in those circumstances. This is certainly acceptable. Uh, there are a lot of precautions people can uh, put in place to frequently hand wash. I want you to be mindful of people who live with disabilities. It includes those who are visually impaired. Uh, some may require assistance at times. Uh, other people with other uh, disabilities may require assistance. So we uh, should be mindful of that and, and not uh, be too judgmental in our uh, frame of mind right now with physical distancing. Obviously we need to um, uh, ensure all Manitobans are safe during these times. You know, we again hear a number of stories of, of late presentations uh, for medical illnesses other than COVID-19. I really want to uh, make it clear to Manitobans that our hospitals, our healthcare system is safe to utilize. Certainly the message is if you are mildly ill, stay home, call health links. But if you uh, think you may be in need of medical care, it's certainly safe to attend for, for care. Our hospitals are safe. Our health professionals take uh, every precaution. Uh, our health system has been building its capacity. Uh, so certainly do not avoid necessary medical care. Stay in touch with your health care providers. Stay on top of your chronic health conditions. And if you have acute conditions, uh, please do not delay uh, getting attention to those. Our healthcare facilities are safe and they're there to, to help you in these circumstances. So call health links if you need further information. If it's an emergency, certainly call 911, uh, but do not uh, let other 
health issues get out of hand during these times. We have a lot of uh, advice out there, Manitobans. Manitobans are really stepping up to interrupt the transmission here, uh, but there are other health issues, so please do not forget about those. I want to remind you to continue to seek credible information. Our website, manitoba.ca slash COVID-19 is up to date. And uh, try to uh, search up credible information, withstand the, um, uh, the reach for fear or stigma in these times. Uh, it's the knowledge that will get us through it. It's our actions that are getting us through this right now. So I want to continue to encourage Manitobans to stay up to date on the information and to continue our uh, efforts, which appear to be uh, paying off uh, at this point. All that is to show us that we are not helpless against this virus, that our actions are showing some effects, and that uh, uh, now is the time to continue with those actions. We cannot loosen up our social distancing strategies. We need to continue with them right now. We need to uh, address these next couple critical weeks in this outbreak. Uh, then we can start to uh, look at the possibilities of, uh, of uh, loosening some of these measures. We know that we're going to deal with this virus going forward for quite some time, but not necessarily to the degree that what we're looking at right now. So, uh, so I think we, we should be optimistic, uh, but we should not loosen our grip right now on these measures. We need to ensure physical distancing, stay, physical distancing, stay home as much as possible, uh, the orders are in place and will remain in place until at least April 28th. And uh, I want to thank Manitobans uh, for all their efforts, uh, uh, which are starting to show off uh, in, our, in our numbers at this time. So thank you, and I'll, I'll pass that over to um, Netno. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to begin today by providing an update on the health of our clinical providers. To date, occupation occupational and environmental safety and health reports that 21 healthcare workers have been have tested positive for COVID-19. These staff members primarily work in health facilities in Winnipeg, 19 in total, plus there are two positive cases involving healthcare workers that have been confirmed in Interlake Eastern Regional Health Authority. We remain at zero in Prairie Mountain Health, Northern Regional Health Authority, and Southern Health Santa Sud. Of the 21 cases, uh, we can share that seven were nurses, are nurses, three medical staff, and 10 from various allied health and support areas. And within the recovered category, we can update that nine have returned to work and 12 continue to um, self-isolate. We can further update that we have not had a positive healthcare worker confirmed as COVID-19 positive since April 9th. Uh, we do consider this to be in large part related to the extensive contact tracing that was involved with each positive case to identify close contacts and potential exposures, and also um, part of the extensive screening methods that are happening. So I just wanna thank all the staff who um, have been really conscientious and that, that's a stressful time for, for everyone and uh, hopefully we're on the other side. And uh, so thanks everyone for, for uh, working through that. Uh, Winnipeg is also opening its second COVID-19 assessment clinic uh, at Sergeant Tommy Prince Place today. The assessment clinic offers primary care services uh, on an appointment basis for anyone who has po tested positive for the virus or else has any respiratory symptoms such as cough, sore throat, uh, any shortness of breath. So people should call their family physician or their primary care provider to determine if they need an appointment. Uh, at this space, the Sergeant Tommy Prince Place, there's also a testing site, so you can get a swab there. And it's in a separate spot from the assessment clinic, but in the same area. 
So with this now open and underway, uh, Mount Carmel Clinic will return to its mandate of offering primary care services to the community. The hours for both the clinic and the testing site um, are from nine till five, seven days a week. And I also just wanted to provide an update on the isolation centers. So these isolation centers, as you recall, were established for those individuals, both staff and patients who tested positive and required a dedicated space to isolate, as well as um, close contacts of COVID positive patients. So we've been using a number of different ways to ramp up the use and availability of these centers. And there's, it's a multi-pronged approach. So we've been working with multiple provincial government departments. We've been working with the federal government, which has a mandate to ensure that returning international travels are isolated upon their return to Canada. We've been working with hotels. We've been working with homeless shelters, uh, First Nations communities, as well as the Canadian Red Cross. So it really has been an impressive effort of a bunch of people working together to make sure that this resource is available and uh, really a key part of reducing the spread of this virus in the province. So information about the various protocols like the cleaning protocols are being shared at all levels. Those have been established. Um, daily wellness checks are um, happening for all those who are staying in these isolation centers and they follow the public health protocols and um, as a reminder uh, if a client or someone who's staying in these spaces if their health does deteriorate we would be taking them to a hospital for further assessment clients who are in these spaces receive three meals a day and they're provided with um, various things to do and activities uh, within their rooms, but also passes um, to get outside and get some fresh air a couple times a day if they're asymptomatic. Um, for the isolation, the hotel isolation center, I can report that 15 people have been referred there and uh, since April 4th, and three have ended up accepting the offer to stay. Uh, meanwhile, 13 people have stayed at the isolation center for, um, for those experiencing homelessness since opening last Thursday night. So currently 11 people are staying um, there as of Tuesday evening. We expect at the shelter that uh, there'll be 39 rooms that will be open and in use by the end of this week. And to date, more than 30 hotels and inns from across the province have inquired about hosting isolation centers. So that's great because we weren't sure if there'd be a lot of interest. So that's really positive. And we expect to open more locations in various areas throughout the province um, if and when the spread of this virus continues. And just lastly, I want to recognize the indispensable work of the emergency dispatchers. Today or this week is National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. So emergency dispatchers across the province handle more than 1.2 million calls per year, coordinating with police and firefighters and paramedics to ensure that people get the help they need when they need it. And these people perform a crucial task, often, often cutting through a lot of chaos to gather essential information from callers that first responders who are headed to a scene need in order to perform their job safely and do it well. So this is an invaluable service, especially during a pandemic when every in-person interaction should be scrutinized for safety. So to the dispatchers and the support staff that are working in those dispatch centers uh, for the city of Winnipeg and Brandon, as well as those who work for the RCMP and the Medical Transportation Coordination Center, I want to thank you very much for all your efforts. And with that, we will open up to questions. Thank you. A reminder to our reporters online, you will have one primary question 
and one follow-up question. And then we'll see where it goes. From Global, Marnie. Good afternoon, Marnie Blunt from Global News. Um, Dr. Rusin, again, uh, fairly low numbers today, and you made it clear for the past few days that people should not uh, be misinterpreting uh, these numbers and letting their guard down with social distancing. Um, having said that, how concerned are you that people are not getting the message and will see low numbers and think that we're in the clear? Um, what's your message to them? Well, I think it's it's important, and that's one of the reasons why we've extended the Public Health Act uh, orders to ensure that people get the message that this is uh, still a very vital time, a very critical time in our outbreak, and and we're going to continue our message. So certainly, we um, uh, you know want to continue to see uh, low numbers, uh, but the only way that's going to happen is if Manitobans continue to strictly adhere to the social distancing strategies that we have in place. And so it's, uh, this is a real critical time for this, uh, for this outbreak. Uh, if we can uh, continue to have this success, if Manitobans continue to do their part, uh, that means the, uh, we're in a position to uh, start loosening some of these restrictions at an earlier point in time. Uh, so, uh, so it's really critical now that we, we continue our efforts. Um, and my second question is, um, it's been about two weeks now since we made changes to be able to fast track former nurses and healthcare workers back into the system uh, to help on the front lines. Can you talk a little bit about what that response has been like so far and um, are more needed to compensate for staff who have had to self-isolate due to COVID-19? Yeah, I think um, my understanding from discussion with our operations team is that people are managing with the staffing that they have okay. Uh, it's really now more a matter of building up capacity um, in preparation for if there's a surge and also just making sure that public health and staff health and health links have, have what they need as our um, high priority areas. So in discussion with the College of Registered Nurses of Manitoba, they have identified that they have issued nine temporary registrations as well as there's 24 more in progress. From the Brandon Sun, Bud. Uh, good day. Uh, Dr. Wilson, could you tell me the uh, woman who died in Prairie Mountain? Did she have any underlying medical conditions and was she in ICU in Prairie Mountain House? There were underlying medical conditions and uh, was not uh, an intensive care uh, patient. You said not in intensive care? Correct, not, not in the ICU. Are there uh, follow up any other uh, patients in Prairie Mountain Health uh, hospitalized right now with COVID nineteen? I am not. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, any admissions uh, at this point. From CJOB, Diana. Good afternoon, Diana from six eighty CJOB. Um, Mr. Ogusa, what can you tell us about the personal protective equipment conservation strategy document? I believe that's in the works. Uh, yeah, we're always looking at our personal protective equipment. Um, so we are looking at uh, what other jurisdictions have put into place in terms of the need for um, gowns, gloves, masks, and in what environment with uh, high-risk populations. So that's still being worked through. Um, most of that is online, um, uh, what the guidelines are. And then I think when we talk about conservation, and we've talked about this a lot at our, at our daily conferences, is that uh, we need to um, be aware that uh, the supply chain is precarious. And so we're really looking at it in in short bursts in terms of like two weeks at a time. So we have a long-term strategy, but also reevaluating frequently, um, making sure that distribution goes out uh, instead of maybe big bulk deliveries, um, short, uh, shorter um, amounts um, so that they can, we can uh, ebb and flow with the challenges that we're facing. So, um, I think in terms of conservation, we should always be looking at conservation. Part of the conservation is also looking at um, uh, reusable supplies, supplies that can be reprocessed um, 
and and every opportunity we can to make sure that our staff are safe, uh, the public is protected, and the equipment is and the supplies is where they need to be. Thank you. And as a follow up, uh, we we're hearing from some healthcare providers that there's kind of nervousness in some clinics, especially in rural Manitoba, that nurses and doctors who should be seeing patients in clinics and health centers don't have the PPE, uh, and there's kind of a reluctance to see patients. Um, what can you tell us about that, and how would you solve that problem? Yeah, I think uh, what I would suggest is there is supplies being sent out every day and we meet with logistics and, and they, re they let us know when there's uh, challenges with shipments coming in, but they also reassure us that uh, in, the supplies are being delivered. So if you are a site and you have concerns, um, then probably uh, raise it. Uh, I believe there's also, uh, if it's not up yet, it will be up soon as a portal uh, where you can go online uh, to make your request. So that, uh, if it will be coming soon. And, um, and there are, you know, when we talk about conservation, it, it may be, it's a, it's a mix of keeping people safe and working in a different way. So if there are opportunities to uh, do virtual visits, um, I would I would recommend that might be an opportunity if there's um, if there's if inpatient or in person visits are required then absolutely that should happen um, and then you need to have the PPE and use it um, appropriately and there are venues where we can make sure that you get that from the Winnipeg Sun Scott. Hi, uh, Scott Billick here, Winnipeg Sun. Uh, question for Dr. Rusin. Um, it was the, uh, the woman who died um, or this death, uh, was she hospitalized at all? Um, just looking at uh, the hospitalizations, uh, hospitalization event, um, and, and they haven't changed since yesterday. So just wondering if, if at all, if you can update that. Yes, this, was, uh, this person was hospitalized. Okay. Um, and I'm just wondering, with the little case numbers, um, that are coming in. Um, do, do you have a sense of the impact that's having on uh, the research being done at the University of Manitoba? Right, so um, so I haven't received an, an update about how many people have been enrolled. Certainly that uh, that uh, research there, the hydroxychloroquine uh, study is uh, uh, confirmed uh, cases and their contacts or healthcare workers that, uh, uh, that have been um, exposed to confirmed uh, cases. So. Uh, I don't know the uh, the um, uh, uptake of that of that trial. Certainly, the um, uh, the more cases we had, the more people who would be eligible for that. Um, but uh, but I don't know exactly how many people are enrolled at this time. CBC Radio Canada, Julian. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Roussin. Uh, some provinces like Quebec are considering maybe reopening schools before the end of the year. Regarding the situation here in Manitoba, do you think this is a realistic schedule for us? So we are um, uh, we're behind those provinces in our in our trajectory. Uh, so they've had uh, cases a lot longer than us. Uh, so at this point, we are uh, we're dealing with this critical point in our in our outbreak. Um, we're going to continue with uh, whatever measures that uh, is dictated by the uh, by the evidence, uh, but we're looking at all sort of exit strategies. What type of things might be in the, in the near future? So, uh, right now, that's that's not something that's been specifically uh, addressed. Uh, but nothing's been off the table as we um, as we address this, and nothing will be off the table as we look at how we're going to um, start reopening things. Uh, but I don't have anything uh, specific to comment on that. And I have to follow up uh, just a bit more in detail in the numbers. Uh, you're saying that there is uh, 132 active cases, but when we subtract the number of uh, people recovered and the number of diseases from the 246, we have 133. So I was just wondering if the number is right. Yeah, well, th those numbers are always being uh, reconciled. So, you know, we have a, uh, some of our probable cases uh, are, are named as probable 
uh, if they were uh, symptomatic and had very close contact with the case, we might just name them a probable case uh, pending the test result. And then if we get a negative result, that's why sometimes there you're seeing like, uh, for instance, today, two probable cases when we got their test back as negative, then they're removed from our case count. Uh, so it's probably just the, just the numbers like this. The, the numbers are coming and changing frequently. So we'll continue to follow up on that. From CBC Manitoba, Bart. Currently, Keith of CBC, Dr. Reeson here. Ten apart, the Ottawa Health Regions uh, basically told people to stop hanging out at a safe distance, but with their neighbors. Uh, what specific advice do you have? Specific advice do you have about uh, people in Manitoba hanging out on their front steps, in their back patios, in their driveways, in parks, near their neighbors and friends? Yeah. So I mean, I think that the. Uh, uh, again, this this messaging here is if if uh, if it's an individual who needs a black and white answer, the answer is stay home, right? So if people can deal with a bit of um, uh, using judgment, then we can say certainly uh, out on your front steps and on your uh, your driveway, uh, enjoying the outdoors in in your backyard is uh, is okay. Shouldn't invite your neighbors over into your backyard. Um, but uh, but enjoying the outside around your house, going for a walk around the block, if you're certain you can maintain that two meter separation, um, going to the park if it's not crowded and you can keep that two meter separation, then uh, then okay. So uh, you know so messaging is always difficult because you want to make sure that the the clear message is uh, stay home as much as you can, uh, go out for uh, for essential reasons. Um, Weather's getting nice. Uh, it'd be nice to be able to enjoy it out, and certainly, I would say enjoying out in your yard is fine. But uh, not to have your neighbors over, even uh, you know, even outside, uh, is probably the best advice right now. We're at the critical stage, uh, so let's keep uh, 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 keep our efforts in place right now, uh, and we might be able to see a time uh, relatively soon when we can start loosening some of these restrictions. From CTV Winnipeg, Michelle. Hi, it's Michelle Dillon from Winnipeg. I'm wondering about uh, Manitoba's mortality rate. Is, is it within what you guys are expecting? Oh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't catch that. Um, the mortality rate in Manitoba is it in within what? you're you are expecting that's right so you know look at at, at canada and then many other jurisdictions we see about that uh, two percent uh, mortality rate and so um our we're keeping in with the hospitalization rate and the icu rate and our, our mortality rate is um uh, is keeping in line with uh, uh with that of canada also we've asked you before about the modeling, but can you tell us where you're at with that and when we might see something? Yeah, we're still uh, working on that, and certainly uh, because of where we are in our in our trajectory, because we've had uh, you know uh, relatively low numbers because we're early on, uh, the modeling data is um, uh, it proves more difficult. Uh, you know, the more data you can enter into these models, uh, the more likely they're going to be reflective of uh, of a uh, um, you know numbers that are that are reasonable uh, to share and to uh, to guide some of our practice. So we're working on it. We're going to try to get uh, get some numbers uh, to show Manitobans, um, but the combination of our relatively low numbers and where we are in our trajectory, it, it does make modeling a bit a bit more difficult. We're just going to go back to CBC Manitoba Bartley for his uh, follow up. Yes, Dr. Ruth, and also your uh, counterparts in the United States, uh, your, your, the main counterpart, he's got a much more difficult job, I'm afraid, um, has made comments saying he doesn't believe professional sports will have fans this calendar year. What is your opinion? You said that uh, social distancing measures will be listed in stages. Do you believe there will be professional sports in Manitoba this calendar year with fans in the stands? Yeah, it's really, it's difficult, you know, so I mean, all I can say is that we're going to be dealing with this virus for the foreseeable future. We're going to be dealing with this virus certainly throughout this calendar year. What exactly that's going to look like 
is is difficult. So to to you know make a prediction uh, about those things is is not a not really reliable one. It's it's too early for me to say something like that. Um, uh, what uh, what I would say is that uh, you know how we deal with this virus isn't going to look like what we deal with it right now. You know we are going to be able to loosen up some of these measures. What exactly that will look like, it's going to have to depend on on our epidemiology and and the response to our gradual lifting. From the Canadian Press, Kelly. Government, and you mentioned on Monday that there'd actually be a tightening of the restrictions uh, sometime this week. With the numbers remaining relatively low, is that still the plan? There's, we still have um, uh, plans in the works to uh, to look at uh, further public health orders, um, and and it's again the it's a reflection of this critical time that we're in. Um, that we know that uh, uh, we're facing, uh, uh, you know, facing this period where we, we know that the virus is here. We know we've seen some cl uh, of community transmission uh, of this virus, but at the same time, we've been reporting low numbers. So we don't want to set us, uh, ourselves up uh, for a place where we, um, uh, you know, reverse all of the progress that we made here. Uh, so we're going to continue forth with our public health orders that may include uh, uh, some additional measures coming this week uh, because it, this is this is that critical time and so we want Manitobans to be well aware of it that the efforts are um, uh, are working uh, that uh, uh, you know we're, we're quite grateful to Manitobans for all the efforts they put in to flattening our curve uh, but now we, we cannot loosen those measures right now so we're going to continue to push forward And Dr. Rusin, uh, some areas of Canada are talking about how they're starting efforts uh, in regards to rolling out blood tests to detect COVID antibodies. Are there plans for this in Manitoba? So overall, there, there are going to be plans uh, for it. Our public health lab is, is uh, certainly looking into that. We don't have it implemented as of yet. Um, so uh, just to be clear that these, uh, these are not going to be useful in the diagnosis of cases. It's going to be uh, useful in perhaps showing us uh, uh, immunity to the to the virus, um, as well as uh, uh, prevalence studies to give us a bit better understanding of um, um, how widespread this virus is. So yes, we're we're looking into it, and our and our public health lab will be involved, uh, but that work hasn't started yet. From City News, Alex. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Rusin. What other further kind of travel restrictions can Manitoba see now that the government is passing a bill that gives you that power to do so? Right. So I think that the um, uh, their international travelers right now are, are required to uh, self-isolate under the Quarantine Act, uh, and I think that's the that's the biggest uh, risk of importation right now, certainly to uh, our neighbors to the south. So I think that's uh, that's quite important. Uh, we know that with our uh, numbers um, uh, being reported as relatively low at this point, uh, there's other jurisdictions in Canada that uh, that have uh, higher numbers. Uh, and so uh, some of the thought there is whether uh, we've been advising and uh, strongly recommending that people self-isolate from interprovincial travel. Um, and, uh, and so one thing we're looking at is whether uh, the... Uh, we want to have that under, um, you know, under the shape of, a, of an order. All right, thank you. From the Winnipeg Free Press, Danielle. Good afternoon, uh, Danielle Bissolva from the Winnipeg Free Press. Uh, Dr. Bentnerson, I'm just following up on the previous question uh, with those uh, with the legislation to. Uh, provide you more power to restrict movement within Manitoba. I'm wondering if that is something that you'll be considering as well, whether that's restrictions on movement to uh, rural communities from Winnipeg or to cottage country, things of that nature. So these are all things that have been been under consideration, uh, and it's uh, you know it's the same message is that we uh, we're at that critical juncture right now where we need to to ensure we're doing everything we can to limit the transmission of this virus. We're going to need to uh, continue to focus on 
um, on situations that uh, uh, that would be high risk if the virus is introduced into. So things like long-term care facilities, congregate settings, um, and including remote isolated communities. So those are all things that have always been under consideration and we're still uh, looking at that for sure. Thank you. And my follow-up question is for Lynette here in Kusa. Um, so following up on some of the home care uh, pullbacks within, within the WRHA, I'm wondering uh, if you're supportive of assisted living and retirement homes perhaps allowing family members into those facilities to uh, perform some of the services such as bathing and uh, laundry, respite, things of that. Uh, nature while the home care services have been temporarily suspended and if it can be done safely. Yeah, so the home care, if it's impacting um, patients at home um, and in that they can't, they can't, their outcomes would be affected by it, then it's, it's really not recommended. So uh, there are guidelines to that, that each uh, regional health authority uh, would apply and look at on a case by case basis. So in terms of people who live in long-term care or seniors homes, um, you know, the visitor restriction still applies at this point. So uh, it would really have to be, um, carefully looked at because we don't want to be introducing this virus into a uh, personal care home environment. So uh, there would have to be very stringent screening and reasons um, that would be evaluated in terms of um, what what is the, the staff requirements and what is the patient requirements and how do we make sure that uh, those those needs are met. Thank you. All right, to our reporters online, we have a few more moments. Anyone have further questions? Yes, I have a question. Dr. Rusin, Dr. Rusin, uh, you mentioned in your opening statement that um, people were kind of presenting late to hospital uh, because they might be a bit, a bit concerned about the safety of going to hospital. Um, how severe are these things that they're kind of showing up with that are being caught too late? Like, is it a life and death problem? How big of an issue is it? Yeah, well, certainly some of the things that have been reported to me by my colleagues have been quite, uh, uh, quite important, quite critical. So, uh, so that's why we, why we mention it here. Uh, you know, and some of the feedback we get are that um, uh, some people are, you know, hesitant about attending because of the fears of COVID-19. Others, in fact, reported feeling guilty about utilizing healthcare services during this time. And so neither one of those uh, should be a barrier to anyone uh, attending healthcare. So healthcare is safe right now. Uh, we've ramped up our capacity. Um, and so uh, people who need medical care can access it. There's no need to, to be hesitant about it. Uh, certainly the message is there. If you're, if you're mildly ill, then, then certainly stay home. Don't go to work if you're mildly ill. But if, you're, uh, if you need, you, you need health care, our facilities are safe and they're ready to, uh, to assist. And if you're not sure and you want direction, you can also call health links and they can provide some guidance. Dr. Newsom, Bud Robertson, again, is the, the grandson. We got the woman in Prairie Mountain Health. Uh, had she been hospitalized for any length of period before uh, she succumbed, or had she just come into uh, uh, emergency? Yeah, I don't have all the uh, all the dates of, of the admissions or anything of, of the such, so I know it was a, a hospital-based um, uh, death uh, and, uh, and occurred um, in Prairie Mountain Health. Dr. Ruth and Bartley Kivas here. What connection should we make between your statement about late presentation of medical symptoms and the death of a person who wasn't in ICU at Prairie Mountain? Oh, the, the no connection between uh, between that. Uh, these were uh, conditions that were unrelated to to COVID, um, and ones that would uh, uh, seemingly um, uh, you know prompt uh, prompt people to to attend for health care. Uh, and just some reports from my colleagues uh, indicated that they felt uh, that the delay may have been related to their being uh, apprehensive about heading out uh, to a hospital because of COVID being out there. Um, uh, and even in one report that they, they felt um, uh, uh, they didn't want to impose on an already uh, overworked healthcare system. 
So again, neither of those uh, should deter anyone from, from attending health care should they require it. And Dr. Rufin, uh, are you able to elaborate about the antibody research testing that you mentioned in brief yesterday? Uh, can you elaborate upon um, when that would be rolled out, for what purpose and how? Yeah, I can't elaborate too much because we don't have anything specific uh, underway. Um, but when we look at uh, antibody testing in a um, in a in a in the, uh, uh, epidemic situation, uh, we'll we'll do it to uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to de determine immunity, uh, to uh, determine whether the antibodies do provide uh, protection, whether they're neutralizing antibodies, and that can uh, uh, help us moving forward in, in people who may may or may not be susceptible to infection. Uh, the other is uh, zero prevalent studies where we do uh, widespread testing just to get an idea of how much of the population may have been affected by the uh, by the virus, how much um, asymptomatic uh, people who uh, develop infection, develop antibodies who had very mild or uh, undetected symptoms. So it can also help with some of our modeling and our response. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Rufin, I just wanted to ask uh, Lynette a question just to clarify. Um, so you, you updated us with 21 healthcare workers. There were seven nurses, three medical staff, 10 from other areas. Um, uh, that, that adds up to 20. Is there one missing there uh, that you didn't say? Well, let me just check there for you. No, seven nurses, four medical staff, and 10 uh, from various allied health and support areas. Okay, so four medical staff. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Kelly Malone, the Canadian Press. Um, health experts are, are saying that massive testing is needed for us to truly understand containment, and who said that was one of the things that we needed to understand before lifting any restrictions. Alberta's expanding um, their testing to anyone with symptoms, but it looks like uh, Chatham only did about 300 tests yesterday, and previously we were seeing numbers around 500 tests daily. Um, why has that number dropped, and, and do we have the capacity to test widely yet? So this, uh, the drop in those numbers was largely a, a reflection on the demand. Uh, and so those are, uh, there is no backlog at CADM, so they're, uh, they're testing samples as they're received. Uh, and so we are um, going to be announcing tomorrow some expansions to our testing uh, criteria. Uh, in order to, uh, again, bring those uh, uh, sample numbers up uh, to, to ensure that we are getting a good, uh, a good sample from the population uh, to give us a good idea as we start moving forward with uh, considerations to uh, lifting some of the restrictions. Uh, and so certainly uh, CADM has the capacity to do, uh, do more than what's, uh, what's been brought to them right now. We have time for a couple more questions, if uh, reporters have any last questions. Dr. Ruth, Go ahead. I'm sorry, it's Marnie from Global. Um, we're just still hearing some uh, complaints or concerns from viewers about limited prescriptions for picking up the pharmacy. There's still concerns over uh, making three times the trips to the pharmacy when they're supposed to be staying at home and paying three times the dispensing fee. I know we asked you about this a few weeks ago. Um, is this something that you would look at changing? So, again, yeah, so I mean, this was uh, put in place for uh, um, as the uh, we're preparing for the for the pandemic uh, to ensure that there uh, we didn't have any shortages in, in critical medication supplies. And so this was done at a, a number of jurisdictions uh, uh, throughout the throughout the nation to ensure that uh, um, uh, medications would be uh, continue to be available. Uh, so just like any of our interventions, we continually review it. Uh, we continually see whether it's uh, still needed, if there's any uh, changes that are required. So then this is uh, no exception. We're going to continue to look at that and see if we are going to uh, adjust that moving forward based on what we see here with our numbers. Thank you. 
Dr. Lisa McFarlicky with the CDC. Of the five people who have died from COVID-19 in Manitoba, can you break them down in terms of community transmission or uh, travel or connected to a known case? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't have that uh, in front of me, uh, uh, Bartley, with the uh, with the deaths there. Just uh, just some of the demographics that I shared uh, in, in the past. So, um, uh, I don't have those numbers to report. The um, the ethnic origin or national origin data that you said it was going to be posted. When are we going to see that? We're still working on how um, uh, how to compile that. Uh, and uh, and how well that's going to be uh, shared. So that's that's uh, um, something in the works. And that concludes today's media briefing. Thank you.